Now we shall read from verses 1 to 7 together. 2 Samuel chapter 19, verses 1 to 7, reading. And he was told Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people heard say that they how the king was grieved for his son. And the people get them by saith that day into the city, as people being ashamed, steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face, and the king cried, O oh, my son, Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And Joab came into the house to the king, and said, Thou shalt shame this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved thy life, and the lives of thy sons, and of thy daughters, and the lives of thy wives, and the lives of thy concubines, in that thou lovest thine enemies, and hatest thy friends. For thou hast declared this day, that thou regardest neither princes nor servants, for this day I perceive, that if Absalom had lived, and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Now therefore arise, go forth, and speak comfortably unto thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night. And that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from thy youth until now. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's turn to God in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for a day of service and worship and bringing us safely into thy house in the time of fellowship over the food. And Lord, as we come to understand more from your word about David's life, the decisions that he made, Lord, may you teach us lessons as we make decisions as men, as head of the homes, as individuals at work, in church. Lord, grant to us the wisdom that we need, that we will not make the wrong decisions and also learn from lessons that went wrong in David's life and the things that went right. Be with us, be with the sisters downstairs as they study your word as well. Lord, use thy word to build strong foundation for thy church. Among thy children, this night we pray. Remove all tiredness. Lord, speak to us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Now, David, as we recall, until now, maybe I ask, um, I ask Justin. Justin, were you here the last time? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fast. Uh, Ignatius, you were not here the last time also? Okay. Um, maybe Joshua. The, the last time when we were studying about David's life, uh, where did we stop? What was happening in his life? What can you remember? He was being pursued by Absalom, his son. Why? Okay, so now Absalom, one of David's son, decided that he are, he's going to rise up and try to kick his father off the throne, right? Abdicate, get the throne from him and pursued him, right? And David and his men and some of his family have to quickly leave the palace, right? And then they went into exile, they were running, trying to escape the son. The son sent armies to go after him. Now, all these things were happening. Why? Why? Brother Douglas, do you remember why? Why did all these things befall him? Yes. King David himself committed adultery, committed that sin, and God told him already, because of this sin, he will have a lot of trouble in his home, right? Now, sin, always remember, sin has consequences. Did God forgive him? God forgive him. God said, you will not die. But God told him, sin has consequences. So, I hope we remember from the last lesson, last few lessons, when we commit sin, yes, we are saved and we might even not... Um, uh, be dealt with by God directly, but the sin itself 
will have many consequences in our life. And you look at David's life, it was a life of terrible turmoil. A lot of problems, right? Okay, so that was the warning. Now, so, then we come to this point now. Remember that um, uh, King David's son, Absalom, in the end, was pursued by David's men. Eh? He lost the battle, trying to kill his own father. Can you imagine how terrible the situation is? Trying to kill his own father so that he can be king. Uh, David's men actually won the battle, pursued after Absalom. Right? Then Absalom was... Um, what happened to Absalom, Sujin? Find his. Treat him kindly, right? Treat him kindly. Now, what happened to Absalom was, now let's turn to uh, chapter 18. Chapter 18. Okay, verse 9 um, and 10. Shall we read 9 and 10? And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule. And the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and it was taken up between heaven and earth, and the mule was under him, went away. And a certain man saw and told Joab, said, Behold, I saw Absalom hang in an oak. Remember the description of Absalom was his hair was very thick, very long. Right? And what he was very vain about, he would weigh his hair every year. What is so vain about that was the thing that's going to get him caught in a branch. Okay? Now, God, sin always has its consequence. What Absalom did, God will also deal with him. Remember that. Okay? So God also dealt with Absalom. He could not get away with his sin of trying to take the throne and kill the father. So he was hanging, hanging there. And we read later on. Um, now, King David, like Sujin said, told the people, if you find my son, deal nicely with, be kind to him, right? Be kind to him. Now, what did Joab do? Now, Joab saw one of the, the servants who came and said, um, Joab, he's hanging there. So he's not, he's alive, you know, hanging there, alive, struggling. Then, what did Joab say? Now, look at this. Now, I need you to understand Joab's character, huh? because after this, we're going to ask a lot of questions. Know what Joab what kind of Joab person Joab is? Now, look at, like, shall we read 11 to, um, 11 to 15? What did Joab do? 11 to 15? And Joab said unto men that told him, And behold, thou sawest him. Why didst thou not smite him there to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and girdle. And the man said unto Joab, Though I should have received a thousand shekels of silver in mine hand, yet would I not put forth my hand against the king's son. For charge thee and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Behold, that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against my own life. For there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself would have set thyself against me. Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts with his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And the ten men that were that bare Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. Now this young man who saw Absalom dangling there went back to tell Joab. Now Joab said, you should have killed him. If you kill him, I would have given you ten shekels of silver, a lot of money, uh, and, and, a, and a girdle. You'll be... You, you'll be um, um, dressed well with my armor. Now, all those things, but this man said this. What did this man say? Even if I had 10,000 shekels, I would not have killed him. Why? Because, look carefully, yeah? now, what did this man say about Joab? He said, I heard the king told you and Abishai and Ittai, don't touch the young man. Now, if I touched him, look at verse 13. If I touch him, I shall have falsehood against my own life. He said, if I touched him, I may as well kill myself. Why? Why? Look at his answer. Now, this is a soldier telling the, his general. Huh? 
For there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself would have set thyself against me. He said nothing is... The king will always know of everything. Eventually he will find out. I killed him. But even if the king don't find out, what? You will have told the king that I killed your son. What is he saying? What is he saying? Now this is very telling about Joab's character. It's quite scary. <laughs> this soldier knows Joab well enough. Joab, I know you want to kill him. Right? And if I kill him, it will be perfect for you. You want him dead? I did the job and you can blame me. <laughs> and the king will kill me. So I know you. I would have just killed, I might as well kill myself. I right? said, so, no, I won't do that. Even if you give me 10,000 shekels, I would not have done anything. So now, and we know uh, um, uh, Joab, knowing the king's order, but he still took three darts, went and killed Absalom. Actually, it's a terrible scene, right? Um, um, God reveals the hearts of men. Now, Absalom, is it very terrible to see Absalom? You think about it, a young man hanging on the tree. This general comes, take three short spears, and spear it through his heart. Now, this Joab, he's a very seasoned soldier, eh? very seasoned uh, fighter. In fact, you see his war, he's always been war. He's a very good fighter, also very good at murdering people. Now, when they spear, he can spear three spears, th three spears into one heart. You know, how, 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 how uh, um, accurate a uh, uh, man in war he is, but very cruel, right? Can you imagine? Is it very cruel? Maybe uncle, you're hearing, is that, wow, the Bible has such frightening stories. <laughs> Right? But the Bible tells us the wickedness of men. Right? The wickedness of men. Men are very wicked. God reveals all this to us. And God also knows, God also shows men that when men do wicked things, like this son who wants to kill the father to be king, wicked things, great judgment will be upon them. Right? It's very scary. So um, um, the Bible is not, they don't like to, the, God does not, like to tell us this story, but he tell us to show man how sinful man is and how terrible sin is and the consequences. And God, wicked man will judge wicked man, right? So this is what happened. Now, so now King David, okay, everything come. Absalom killed and then the, the, the people kind of don't know what to do, so they all ran back to the city. Now how? We were following Absalom who made himself king. Now Absalom is dead. David, come back to the city. What are we going to do? All right? So the people are now all trying to figure out what to do. Now, then we read this scene. All right? We read this scene in chapter 19. So David kept crying. Hmm? David came back. Look at chapter 19. Now, from here on, David is in turmoil. Understand that. David is, I, my son, my beloved son is killed. I come back. Some people are, want to receive me back. Some people don't want to receive me back. They are also frightened of me. So David is in turmoil. And from here, this chapter onwards, you're going to see David having to make one decision after another. Okay? That's why I titled the, the message on wisdom in decisions. David is going to make many decisions under this kind of condition. Then we must learn what are good decisions, what are bad decisions as men. As men at home, as men at work, very often we are called to make decisions. We have to have very clear principles so that under any kind of situation, we will make the right decisions. Understand? Now, David's situation is not nice. Huh? You imagine you just have your son killed, your nation, some of them want to kill you still. You do not know whether they will, will receive you back. Very difficult time. Not like us most of the time, very calm, questions come, we know what to do. Now, Let's see David's um, first decision, okay? Now, chapter 19, David came back morning, morning, crying for the sun, right? Crying for the sun. Now, in fact, verse 2, the victory was turned to morning. The king's small band of army actually won the battle against a big group of people that decided to follow Absalom, right? It was a great victory. But what happened? <coughs> 
Look at verse 3. But the people kept seeing the, the king crying, crying. The people get them, by, get them by stealth that day into the city as people being ashamed, steal away when they flee into battle. What, what is he saying? Now, normally when you win a battle, as you've seen previously, when they come back with King David, what happened? <coughs> Music, celebration, victory march in, right? But this time they came in with David and they follow and they see the king, like that literally, right? In verse, in verse 4, he cried with a loud voice, My, oh, my son, Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son, crying on the way in. Then the people, what is verse 3? The people now, instead of victory, shouts, you know what is, uh, the Chinese say? Cheng uh, kai kai like that. Means uh, qu like quiet little chickens come in. <laughs> Just dare not, dare, not, dare not say anything. Like people who as if they lost a battle and they're trying to secretly run away. It was that kind of scene. A very, very different scene from how David used to come in when he win battles. Uh, all like, like little chickens, very ashamed that lost the battle, instead of vi uh, a victory entrance, is like that. Now, so that's one, uh, that's one, remember that. And then, so now I ask you this, question number one, what did David do? What was his choice when he walked in, and what were the effects? What should David, king of Israel, have done instead? What David do, very clearly, he chose to mourn and weep publicly, for his son, right? What were the effects? The people themselves dare not celebrate the victory. Okay, so now I ask, maybe I ask, uh, ask fathers, father, uh, Edward, right? If your son got killed in battle, would you cry? Naturally. Which father won't cry? Especially to hear that your son was killed by your own general, right? When you say, don't touch, don't touch him. But even as a father, the king, you did not manage to stop it and he died. Hmm? Yes. Now, if you look further, uh, further back. Okay. They came in, in verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 19. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Amma say, When Joab sent the king's servant and me, I saw a great tumor, but I knew not what it was. Then next, right? So he knew that Joab was involved. Because the servant said, uh, Joab sent, Joab sent. This person, either he knew or he did not say. He said, But, but Joab sent. Right? But Joab sent. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stood still. And then in verse 31, and Cushai came and said, Tidings, my Lord, um, and the Lord has avenged you. And how is the young man? How is the young man in verse 32? Is the young man Absalom safe? And then verse 33, the king was much moved and went to chip. And the, the enemies of my Lord, the king, and all that rise against thee, do they hurt? Be as the young man is. It's all couched answer. None of the soldiers dare to say what happened. But they say, Absalom, uh, Joab, Sen, and they say, oh, all your, enemy, all your enemies that are not good to you, they died, they died. That's all. all right? So, King David probably in his heart knew. In fact, later you will see King David is always very worried about Joab. Now, why do you think he would have suspected that, I think I know what happened? I won't say for sure. Lah. Why? Remember before this, what did Joab do? No, he, ca he killed. He killed Abner, right? He killed Abner. Abner came to make peace. And then he is supposed to make peace. David already declared make peace with Abner. Abner will transfer things to, to us and all that. But he went to the back and killed him. He knew that this man is like that. Right? So when you hear uh, Joab send and all this news, ah, all your enemies are dead, who is fighting against his enemies now? Joab was leading the battle. Joab was leading the battle. All right? So um, most believe that 
in his heart he knew. Because later on he told his son, make sure you kill Joab. Make sure you kill Joab. So in his heart he probably knew it's something to do with him. But he kept crying. So now the question is this. Okay, so now this is a very, very important thing we need to keep in mind when we make decisions. Is it, is it normal? Yes, of course, the father will cry. Which father won't cry? Right? But should he have cried? Eugene, should he have cried? No, don't ask father. Don't ask single. Uh, John, should he have gone around crying, crying, Ooh, my son, my son, and going like that? First, we acknowledge fathers will cry, right? In this house, city. even if it's a wicked son, we, the father was still, ah, my son, right? So we understand that. But should he have cried like that? And march in. What do you think? Probably not. Probably not. The question is why? Why do you think so? Why would you think, oh, I don't think he should have done that. La. Understand, la. Right, fathers will cry. La. If I were there, I would put my arm around him also. La. But for him to do this going in, he should not have. La. Why? Why do you say that? What was his position? His king. Very good. That's why I give you the clue, right? But should David, comma, king of Israel? <laughs> right? You're right. He's king. He is king and his father, correct? He's king and his father also. But the question is this. You're right. He's king. Somehow, as a king, you should not do that. Should we say, well, king, not father. King also got hard, but, you know? So, Ben, why? why, why? As a king, he shouldn't have do that. Shouldn't have done that. Why was such, it such a bad decision? He was meant to be the appointed king for Israel. Is it that? <laughs> because, he's appoint, because he's supposed to be the appointed king of Israel, yes, it is that. Very good. Because he is the appointed king of Israel and, and his son tried to take the throne away from him. He is the appointed king. And, and what? He should not? Because his son tried to take the throne from him, then he should not have cried like that because this was the right thing to do. What was the right thing to do? Not to kill the son, but to, to, to regain his throne. Not to kill the son. To regain his throne is true. Now, he's happy to regain his throne, but his son got killed. You're right. As a king, he said, this is appointed. Now, remember this, sir, because I'm going to ask you, what's so important as he's the appointed king? Number one. Number two is, he should have dealt with it. He should have dealt with his son who tried to take his position as king. But should he have spared his son? Douglas said no. Treason, right? Treason. Treason, you're right. He should have dealt with his son and his son actually should die. Now, when King David, when the soldier, he said, I kill your enemy, King Saul. Then he came to David. I kill your enemy, you know, David, David, now you can become king. I killed King Saul for you. What did David do to him? David, look at his soldiers, kill him now. <laughs> I tell him to kill him. After he's going to check, kill him. Why? David say, how dare you touch who? God's anointed. How dare you touch the man that God made as king? And he said, execute this man. Now, his son just did the same thing. His son tried to kill the king that God appointed. Then, therefore, should his son deserve death? Same. Treason. Should die. In any country, the same. Right? Anyone who tried to kill the king, treason. Die. Number one. But, yeah, so that is right. As a king, he should say, this, this crime deserves treason. This treason crime deserves death. My son is dead. As a father, I, I'm sad, I cry. But I walk out. I must walk out with a man and say, 
we dealt with this rightly, correct? Right? Now, if he, with this crying, let me ask, um, ask uh, Claude, what message is he sending? When he made this decision, when he didn't bother, just cry, 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 make this decision to cry like a father walking down, what message would he send to the people? Yes. He's telling the people, fighting to get back the throne, executing the man that, that committed treason is wrong. That's the message he's sending. Means anyone who rises up in treason, we should just ignore. Right? That's a very wrong message. But I ask you this question. This is the most important thing we must understand about, about this decision. Um, why is it even more terrible and even more wrong in this case than any other case of treason? That David must have made the right decision and acted rightly. Okay, the other is what I'm asking. What makes this so terrible? Happens all the time, what? But this one, David made a very, very wrong decision in acting like that. Yes, you can say, oh yeah, poor father, oh, yeah, be understanding, uh, be understanding. Very often we are like that. Uh. Uh. Now, if another case, I would say, maybe we can say that and feel like that. But in this case, absolutely cannot. Why? What do you think? Alex, what do you think? In this case, definitely David have made a very wrong and unwise decision, sending a very, very wrong message to the people of God. Why? Yes, that's right. But I don't know whether you're, you're saying what I'm thinking of. But it sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't push further. <laughs> now, it's, like you say, Israel is a holy people. Israel is God's people, right? Israel is a holy nation. Understand or not? Israel is not like any other nation in the world. Israel is God's appointed nation. Israel's king is appointed by who? By God. Understand that? Israel is meant to be a spiritual nation. Israel cannot, Israel's king cannot make decisions based on what other kings would do, what other kings would feel, how fathers would feel. As a king of God's spiritual nation, he must make decisions looking at it with spiritual eyes. Understand that? That is the very important point that we must not miss. David must make decision with spirit, with the understanding this is a spiritual nation. It's a nation that belongs to God. It's a holy nation. In God's nation, being a holy nation, we are the light. We cannot let this happen. Understand that? If David let this happen and act like it's something that he should have just, he, he wished this should not happen, I, will have prevent, I want to prevent it and all that. Then David is sending a message to the rest of the nations, Israel is also like them. And Israel's king, who is supposed to rule in the place of God, is also like that. Means God is like that. Understand that? Now, the point I want to make is this. When you make decision as a Christian, whether you are at work, whether you are in church, you must always remember, I am making decision as a spiritual child of God, of the Holy God, of the righteous God, of the God of justice. Now, even if it is your own flesh and blood, 
your family. When you make decision, you must not look at it as, this is my family. This is whose family? God's family. As the head of the home, always remember, your family is who God put you as head over. This is God's, God's family. Your child is God's child. What decision you make, you must see this is a spiritual family, a holy family. Same in church. When any leader make a decision, even if it is your wife, your child, your, your, your spouse involved, the same. This is God's church. I make a decision based on what is righteous in God's law. I cannot, because this is my child, this is my wife, this, is my, this affects my family, and therefore, I'm going to let it affect how I feel, act, and behave in church. It will send a very wrong message. Understand that? Okay, so I hope that the, we, are, we have this very strong principle in us. And I hope we are never called to make that choice. But when we are, we must see this is God's church. This family is God's family. Your child come back and say, Daddy, I committed a crime. What did you do? Whatever, you know. I stole something. I hope not that like, I killed someone. <laughs> I did something terrible. What are you going to do? Why family like sit down? Let's figure out how to cover this up. Let's figure out how to prevent our child from getting in trouble. Can you do that? You cannot. This is a spiritual family. You must do what is right. Hmm? Same in church. Please know this. Church must be a place that any leader do anything that is a crime that is sinful. We cannot say, let's band together. You know band together? Let's close ranks. Huh? In the business world, in the army, we always say close ranks. Close ranks means what? We all close around this person and protect this person, right? Whether it's your own flesh and blood, you must see the only th reason why you will do what is right is this is God's nation. This is God's church. This is God's family. You think there are no church that the leaders find, some, find, find out something that another leader did and they close ranks and they protect the leader and they hide it? Of course there is. It's very wrong. This is not the way God expects the church to be. This is not what God expects your family to be. This is not what God expects you as an individual make, making decisions to be. Alright? Understand that? So this is very, very important. I really hope that BPCWA will never reach a stage where we make decisions based on relationships, friendships. It does not matter how long you've been friends. This is child, father and son, you know. It doesn't matter how much the person has done for you. It does not matter. This is God's church. It does not matter what, how much you love your child. This is God's family doesn't matter in your own life how much this means to your flesh. I am a child of God. Okay? So now that is what David missed out in this when he decided to walk down with his people as a father rather than as a king of God's nation. Who appointed him? God. And therefore, this is worse than any other case because David, of all the people, always knew. Touch not what? Touch not what? Touch not the Lord's anointed, right? Even King Saul was God's anointed. He knew King Saul was a wicked king, but he himself did not touch him because he knew in his mind God put him there for a reason. But when he came to his son, he forgot all those. Understand that? Now, you remember this, huh? because um, I will summarize at the end. Actually, you write 7, 7a. Seven when the summarize the key lessons in making decisions, when it may affect my own loved ones and relatives. Okay, what is the first lesson? Remember that the decision is a spiritual decision. No matter how fleshly it looks. Alright, so remember it is a spiritual decision. The church belongs to God. The family belongs to God. Your life belongs to God. Don't, have, don't view things through a physical eyes, that's all. 
Now, this is very physical, right? Your son gets killed, you know. So we still cannot. Now, next one. All right, so remember, uh, uh, um, summarize the key decision. So 7A1, you can add another one is, we cannot send the wrong message. We cannot send the wrong message. When we send the wrong message, unbelievers in the world will say, oh, so Christianity is like that. Remember in Singapore, when the Kong He embezzled how many millions? Uh? Tens of millions. Uh. Yeah, millions. And when the pastor in Singapore embezzled a lot of money, or not embezzled, used the money wrongly for his own wife career, uh, singing career, instead of the church say, this is God's church, we will hand you over to the authority. What did the church do? By and large, most people, they came up to support him. They went to the court, queue up early. To, we are here to support our pastor. It's God's church. But once you think, this is our church, this our pastor, this my relationship, we are so thankful to him. What happens? You make decision not based on a spiritual understanding. Okay? So it's, a, it's very wrong. It's the most shameful thing. That decision that the church made to actually try to close rank and protect the leaders. Christianity is not like that in the Bible. Okay? Understand that. So, now, next thing. Actually, here I want to say another thing. This is an ultimate test of biblical separation. I want you to write that down. This is the ultimate test of biblical separation. We talk about biblical separation, right? Our church stands for biblical separation. Now, don't always think that biblical separation is, is always about separating from them. Sometimes it's separating your heart from your own flesh and blood. Understand that? If your own flesh and blood commit sin, if your own flesh and blood teach false teachings, if your own flesh and blood commit something sinful, your own sibling, biblical separation is you also need to deal with the person as if he is a heretic. you separate. Very difficult, right? Very difficult. It's the most difficult. This, that's why I say this is the ultimate test or biblical separation. If your, uh, I think you all know the story when Kwek Kok Chiang was called to make a decision. Side his son, Kwek Si Hua. Kwek Si Hua say, teach things like, um, I think it was virgin birth is, is not a big deal. And, and private tongue speaking is valid, that kind of things, right? Kwek Siu Hua said this when Reverend Paul said you have to make a decision. And he said this, it's a very difficult decision. You're asking me to choose between my flesh and blood and the BP movement. I'm afraid I have to choose my son. Hmm? When it comes to biblical separation, easy to separate from charismatics, right? Easy to separate from the church down the street, right? Easy to separate from all this. But when your own flesh and blood say, tongue speaking has not ceased. Private tongue speaking, fine. When you're called to make that decision, even flesh and blood, biblical separation, you have to... In fact, it's a very simple choice. It was not a choice between my son and you, Dr. To, I Reverend To. It's not that. Because of the failure to see, it is between my son and what? God's church. Just like David failed to see this is God's nation. 
Once you're not clear, you will make the wrong decision. All right? So remember that. And then we have the split. Very sad. Fail to understand this principle. We learn from it. Okay? If it does ever happen in our church, we better make the right decision. Now, next. So that's a test of, test of biblical separation. Now, next. Now, compare Joab's thinking versus David. Is there any difference? Now, let's look at chapter 19. It's related very quickly, chapter 19. Now, what did, King, what did, David, uh, what did Joab say? Eh? Chapter 19, verse 6. Very, very courageous, right? He looked at David and said, if like, you're crying and all that, your people fight for you, they save your family, and then now you love your enemies and hate your friends. And he said, if Absalom lived today, we all had died, I think you'll be happy. Yeah, that's what he's saying, all right? Wow, very courageous words. Looks like a man that does what is right, right? That's what is right. If you are there, should you say this? Yes, you are. Love your enemies rather than your friends. If we die, I think you're happy. So, courageous word. So, you compare his thinking. Is the thinking correct? The thinking is correct. What he said is absolutely correct. Now, but you, do you think that Absalom is any different from David? Hmm? Say, yeah, okay, this morning was Esau, 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 with Cain. Okay, what did I say? Okay, what I should say is, is Joab any different from David in reality? From what he, what he does? We said already, right? When, why did Joab kill Abner? in the early history. Why did he kill Abner? Because Abner killed his brother. Remember? Abner killed his brother and then Joab just keep watching. And then when there's a chance, he killed Abner. <laughs> okay? We're tired now. He killed Abner. All because he would commit murder. Because my brother was killed by you, right? Is Joab really very different? Not really. When it comes to flesh, I will do anything. Correct or not? When it comes to my <coughs> taking revenge for my brother, I will secretly kill you. He will do anything. So it's no different. Now my point is this. In decision making, it's very easy when it is someone else. You look at David, hi uh, you, <laughs> right? How can you love your own son more than that kind of thing, right? But actually, is Joab any different? Joab is not any different. The point is, it's the same for us. It's very easy to say and make right decisions when, it is, when your own flesh and blood is not involved. Understand that? Okay? Now, the whole point of question one and two is this. When we are caught in making decisions and any loved one is involved, we have to keep going back. This is God's family. This is God's church. This, I am God's child. We have to always go back to that. If we don't, we will send a message to the world and we will shame the name of Christ. Understand that? We are holy people. Uncle Zeng. 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 Do you hear about the Singapore case where the pastor channel millions of dollars to support his wife's dancing career? Have you, did you hear about that? Yes. yes. What do you think of Christianity when the church come out and protect him? What was in your mind? How can Christians be like that? It's okay to say frankly. Yes, right? Right? Now, so the people outside the church will say, whoa, even the, even the world's law is more righteous than the Christian who say, wow, their God is a holy God. Correct? That's why, but, Christ, but the Bible is not like that. Christ, when Christians behave wrongly, that is what is wrong. Understand? All right? So that's why we must learn. People will, be, people will misunderstand what God is. And that is because we don't see church, family, our life as God's. It's not spiritual. It's very physical to us. So there's not much difference between him and, and, and King David. It's just easier when it is not my family involved. So that's what we must apply in our thinking. 
even when it is our own flesh and blood, we must do what is right. Make the right decision. Now, next, quickly. Okay, quickly. Now, so first decision, bad choice of who he chose to be. He chose to be a father rather than the high and holy God who appointed as king of his holy nation. Okay? So same for me as a pastor. I'm appointed by God and I always must not fail him. If you see that I fail him, tell me. All right? Same for you. When I see that you fail God, I will tell you. Why? Because we are all making decisions based on a spiritual um, basis, with spiritual basis. Now, next. Next. <coughs> Question number three. Now, who was Amasa? Now, we move on. Okay, next scene. David now have to make another decision. Immediately after this decision. Okay, I'll tell you the story. Eh? Uh, actually, from verse 8 onwards. What happened is, some of the people... So David came back and David said, okay, I won't go into the city because I don't know. Right? I don't know whether the people are still for me. Absalom is dead, but they may still kill me. So David waited at the gate and say, and see, are you all going to invite me in? Okay? Are you going to invite me into the city? Now, some came, some did not. Now, then he think, now I need to quickly um, garner support. Right? He come back, son is dead. The son declared himself king. People followed him. Is he still king or not? Then you think, I need to now garner support. Get support for myself, right? You come back. Now, what did he do? He came in and look at verse 13. Uh, verse 13. And he, he told the people, Now go and say to Amasa, Thou art thou not my bone and of my flesh. God do so to me and more also if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. Now, David came back and said, Hey, people, go and look for this man called Amasa. Tell Amasa, I will make you captain of the host of Israel. I will make you captain. In place of who? In place of Joab. Hmm? In place of Joab. Now, who is Amasa? You got to uh, see first. All right? Now, verse chapter 17, verse 25. Who is Amasa? Chapter 17, verse 25. And Absalom made... Absalom, eh? The, the son with the long hair that was killed. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the host instead of Joab, which Amasa was a man's son whose name was Ithra, Ithra, Ithra An, Israelite that went to Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister of Zeruiah, Joab's mother. Now, first of all, who is Amasa? Amasa was the one that Absalom, when he revolted, he made him captain of the army. Okay? Now, and further details was given. He's actually David's um, nephew. Okay, when you trace, trace, he's actually King David's nephew. So Absalom made King David's nephew his captain of his host. And he didn't, he didn't, ask, he didn't, he didn't ask Joab to join his side. So this is Amasa. So he said, quickly go and tell Amasa. We are, we are flesh and bone, right? Flesh and bone. Huh? You look at chapter 19, verse 13. Tell Amasa, hey, uncle, say to you, uh, uncle, uh, you are flesh and bone. Uh, Amasa, don't worry. I know you were made captain of the host of Israel. I will keep you as captain instead of Joab. Now, Joab has been always fighting battle with David, right? Since the time they were in, in wilderness. Say, don't worry, Amasa, you make captain. I leave you as captain. You're my nephew anyway. Right? Anyway, Joab also his nephew. <laughs> okay? So they are related. Joab and Amasa are, are related, cousins. Now, so now he has to make this decision, and he made this decision. The question is, question number three, why did David want Amasa to be captain of Israel's host? Now you have to make this decision. What was wrong and what was right about this decision? Anyone know? Kenny? Any idea? Why suddenly David come back? Ah, Amasa, I made you captain. I won't let... I won't, instead of Joel, I made you captain. To garner, to garner the support was one. Correct. Was to garner support for himself. Anything else? 
Anyone suspect anything? You think will know. Colin. He wants to replace Joab. Alright, he wants to replace Joab. The question is, why he wants to replace Joab? Why? <laughs> For killing his son. Okay, that's one. I will tell you not to kill my son, you kill my son. Right? How, can, how can I trust you in the future? Number one, right? And also, remember when he killed he, when he killed, he killed Abner. He caused a big problem for David, right? I told you. Yes. Didn't he make him. Right, that's a bit more speculation. So I thought as long as not dead yet. So did he make Amasha the captain of the Israel army before or after Amasha was dead? Okay. So in chapter 17, Absalom. Um, the, Absalom was already revolting already. King David already on the run. And Absalom made Amasa the captain of the host in chapter 17. Okay? Absalom made Amasa. Absalom, sorry, it must be me. Absalom made Amasa. Okay, you look at 17 verse 25. Absalom made Amasa captain of the host instead of Joab. Okay? Then now, now, David, now Absalom is dead. David came back and said, Amasa, don't worry. You remain captain of the host instead of Joab. Can? What's your question? Yes. He was Absalom's side. Abs don't know whose side, but, but Absalom who revolted, <laughs> Absalom revolted, say, Amasa, I make you my captain, and you and I are going to pursue my father and kill my father. Joab was always with David. Joab was always with David. Yeah. Now, initially he was always with David. He was always with David. He was David's man. Instead, why instead of Joab, right? No. You see, to no, like for example. Um, Absalom also appointed Ahithophel as his advisor when Ahithophel was David's advisor all along, the uncle. Hmm? So the Bible is saying he could have asked Joab, just like he asked Ahithophel to come over to my side, but he didn't ask Joab to come over to his side. Instead, he asked Amasa. He just simply appointed Amasa. Okay? Okay? Now, so one... He has proven to be this, he was proven to be someone that does not take orders. Hmm? He will do whatever he wants to do. You know how dangerous it is for a king uh, who has a general uh, who always fighting with you, and you can tell him something and he will do something else. So you can understand David is like, hey, this is not gonna work. This is the chance. To replace, like Colin say, chance to replace this general, you know, this very dangerous general, cause a lot of problems for me and kill my son some more. Time to replace him. Good opportunity. <coughs> now, so I ask question number three: What is right and wrong about decision? What is right? The easy one, Adrian. What is right about this decision? He does have to replace God. He has to. He's the king of Israel. And this is a soldier that does not obey the king of Israel, right? So he must be replaced. That's correct. So sometimes in life, you're going to face situations that you must replace. Okay? Maybe you're a person at work. You have one, one employee that's very, very bad. That causes a lot of problems. Sometimes you have to make a decision. You have to replace. Replacing is a right decision, right? So Christians cannot say, I must be kind, nice, loving. This guy always mess up, cause a lot of problems in the company. Don't listen, disobey, go against company laws. But I'm a Christian boss, so I must be nice. I must not replace. Not true. So it's the correct decision. He must make the right decision. So he said, this is, king, this is Israel's army. I cannot put a man like that there. But what is wrong about this decision? Benedict. Yeah, okay, okay. You don't get the relationship. Maybe some others also don't. Okay, try drawing. Now, 
Here is epsilon long hair, right? <laughs> long, long hair. Epsilon chased David out of the city, okay? He made himself king, and he appointed Amasa. He appointed Amasa as his general, okay? He had a group of people, David, King David, okay, King David, left, and David also had a band of soldiers. David's band of soldiers was led by Joab, okay? Good thing this is not FEBC exam. He was led by Joab. <laughs> led by Joab. He could have asked Joab to jump ship, come over, but he did not. He appointed Amasa. Also David's nephew. David's nephew. Joab, also David's nephew. All right? Important relationship, huh? These two are cousins. Okay, so remember this relationship. So, David, then Absalom, Absalom got killed, right? Died. Absalom died. Now David come back to the city. Absalom, Amasa is captain of the host. No? He was officially appointed. So David says, Amasa, my nephew, don't worry. I will continue to let you be the captain of this host and this host that I have instead of your cousin. Correct. Correct. When I come back, don't worry, you'll be captain of the host. Okay? That is my question to you. <laughs> <laughs> now you get it. Well, it is right. He must replace he must replace Joab. Joab has proven a delinquent uh, soldier, right? He must replace. That's the right decision. But now I ask you, what is wrong with his decision in saying, Amasa, don't worry, you continue to be, either you continue to be host of this or host of both, but you will continue to be captain of Israel's host. Provoking Joab, yes, that's one. That, that question, is it a wise decision after we see? But what is wrong with this decision? Okay, you're still not remembering lesson number one. How must we look and think? This is huh? spiritual, right? This is whose nation? Israel is God's nation, right? When David makes decision, he cannot make it based on, he must always make it based on a holy, righteous decision, right? So now I give you the clue already. So now you think like that. I am David. This is God's nation. What is wrong with my decision in making him continue to be captain of Israel's host? This is God's nation. What is wrong? Okay, Yi Chung is raising his hand. Yes. Because he That is correct. So you're raising your hand, right? Not adjusting the camera. <laughs> okay, correct. <laughs> I don't know, he was like doing this. Remember, Amasa, when he saw the sun chase the rightful king out of the city and, be, and try to be king, and if you were Amasa and you saw that, this is God's nation, this is God's appointed man, you as the sun chase him out, as the sun is already wrong, but as Israel's nation, it's even worse, you just chase out God's anointed. And you... Make yourself king. What well, if I were if I were Absalom and I say, Benedict, be the captain of my host, what would you say to me? No, I won't. Why? Because God appointed David king. How dare you do that? This is treason. This is worse than treason. You are going against God's will, right? So he, this, so he is committing something against God's nation. Is it, does David know? David has always said, how dare you touch God's anointed. It's almost like his standard phrase all the time, right? Every time, anything, how dare you touch God's anointed. How dare you touch God's anointed. 
Now, there's someone who actually be part of someone, lead the host for the someone who touched God's anointed. How can he appoint him as captain of God's nation, God's host? That is very wrong, right? Now, when we make decisions, my point is this. The, the wisdom we need is this. Does two wrong make one right? It doesn't. If there's something that needs to be done, whatever solution you think for it must always be a righteous solution. You cannot say, oh yeah, this, this, uh, this pastor or this leader is very bad. Uh. All right? Let's get rid of him, which is the right thing to do. Right? If the pastor is, is, um, is bad, you should not vote for him. You should get rid of him. But what do you do next? Let's just find anybody. It's wrong. All right? And any other decision you make in life, to correct something, make sure the next thing you need to do, you do what is right. To replace this guy is correct. But to replace him with this guy, it doesn't make sense. All right? So when making decision, now, you have to remember, David is under a lot of pressure. You imagine yourself as David. Huh? You come back to sit at the city. Don't know whether they come out and kill me or not. No? Look, if I tell my nephew, hey, you continue to be captain of the host. My nephew may not lead the army to come and kill me at the gate, right? Please, people tell him that. Wow, at the same time, I get to get rid of Joab. Kill two birds with one stone. We must not think of all these things. Do what is righteous. Do what is right. Okay? You have a question? No. All right. So, now David is in a very complex situation. I just hope that when we are in those situations, we remember all this lesson and act rightly. Act rightly. Okay? So, seven, question 7, A3 would be, or A2 would be, Two wrongs don't make one right. Two wrongs don't make one right. Now, do you, do you understand why? Do you understand why in church? I always tell anyone who wants to serve in committees, and I tell this to our session members who are here, right? I always tell you we rather work extra hard than to anyhow appoint someone into session. we rather do that. All the deacons are, are working to bones with family. They're working very hard. You know? Yes, I just can just anyhow appoint some more leaders in. Then everyone free here, right? Is it right to appoint more to help? Yes, it is right. But it is wrong to solve a problem by just anyhow putting someone, doing the wrong thing. I hope you learn about church. Now, next. So now we know who is Amasa. Now, also, the very wrong thing to say is what? Hey, you're my, you're my nephew, huh? Okay, i make you captain of the host. Is it right to say that? Very, very wrong. No one should ever say, you are my so-and-so, come, join, join the company. You are my so-and-so, come. Um, be a church leader. It's wrong. Now, next, question number four. Now, do you think Mephibosheth was genuine? So now David, after this decision, moves to the next. He needs to make some more other decisions. Actually, there are a few other things in between, which uh, we have no time, so I won't cover. But basically, um, i just tell you the story. Huh? Remember the guy who keep cursing David? Keep cursing, 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 throw things at him and all that? He came and said, Ayah, tolong, tolong, sorry, I was wrong. Please forgive me. David said, okay, forgiven. Right? They want to kill him. But David said, ah, for, forgive him. Now, but one of them that came was Mephi Bosheth. Ignatius, who is Mephi Bosheth? Uh, Saul's son. Saul's son, right? He was crippled, correct? He was crippled. And then David took him in to protect him. David assigned a servant to look after him, right? 
Then remember when David was on the run, the servant came and told what about Mephibosheth? The servant of Mephibosheth came and told tell David what? Ah, remember? The servant of Mephibosheth, hey, you know my Mephibosheth, my master, now he go and join Absalom. Then what did David say? Ah, take all the land. Hmm? Take all the land, servant. But is it true or not? What happened? Now, here. So you think, you tell me. You th was, it, was, it, was the servant true or is Mephibosheth true? Now, let us read. Where is it? Um... Hey, sorry. Uh, yeah, before that, chapter question number three. Um, was it wise? Was it wise? Was it wise to put this guy as captain? Just now you say, right? Not wise. Why? Because it's going to make this guy upset, right? It's going to make this guy upset, right? And this guy, when he's upset, what does he do? <laughs> it's a track record of, hello, how are you? <laughs> it's a track record of that. So you're right, it's, it's very, very foolish. So he made very foolish decisions. In fact, what happened is exactly that. It's not wise. Okay, so, so we just see first. Huh? Um, okay, so David restored. Now, uh, look at chapter 20, verse 9 to 10. Chapter 20, verse 9 to 10. Now, this is some more lesson to learn here. Now, let's read. Uh, eh? Copy wrongly. Is it 19? 20, verse 9 to 10. It's correct. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, what did Joab do? Okay, Joab heard that Amasa, my, my cousin, is appointed captain of the host. Now, what did Amasa do? Let's read uh, Joab do, 9 and 10. And Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard and the right hand to kiss him. And Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. So he smote him therewith in the fifth rib and shed out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again, and he died. Okay? All right, so um, Benedict was right. Not wise. He came, how are you? Put the beard. Okay? That's what he did. Now, so oh, Joab is terrible. Poor Amasa. Is it poor Amasa? No, you didn't say no, not poor thing. <laughs> Why not poor thing? He deserved to die. Touch not the Lord's anointed. Very dangerous. All right? So remember, this person went against God's will. There will be judgment. God used this as a judgment. Was it was Joab? Was Joab uh, guiltless? No, Joab is also guilty. Okay? But this is how um, things will be when we, when we sin and do all sorts of things. All sorts of mess will occur. Now, um, Okay, so now I want to say this. Uh, I ask you this question and you think about it. Because I wondered about this question for very long. I might have told, this, told you the answer and you might remember or not. I always wonder. Now, David has always knew that I need to get rid of this Joab. He is a liability to me and to God's nation. He's a liability. And he always tried to figure out. But after this, you don't read him trying to get rid of him anymore. Okay? And then when his son Solomon was made king, what did he tell Solomon? Kill Joab. <laughs> don't let his white hair, white hair go to the grave. Have peace. Kill him. Okay, so imagine... Uh, where's Vincent? Ah, Vincent. All right? Okay, Vincent is, Vincent is king, king, king David. All right? Vincent is king David and... And uh, Ignatius is Solomon. So Vincent goes to Solomon. Now, my son, my son, all right, I'm old. Now, you, young man, you kill David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, something might happen. Now, you kill Joab. You kill Joab, all right? 
Okay, you kill Joab. Okay? <laughs> what were you saying? Hey, Dad, <laughs> you've been trying to get rid of this guy who can, with three, three big spear, three big spear, pierce one heart, you know. You don't want to kill me, ask me to kill him. Uh. You think that, right? Yeah, why don't you kill him? David always wanted to. And David tried, 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 and kept failing. Now, there are some things in life that's going to be like that. No? But I ask you first. Well, well I, I say first. No, I ask you first. <laughs> why? Why? Why do you think, Alex? Why do you think, you think, is David like a, a scary bird, a coward, say, I don't kill, you kill, you kill, you kill. A father that says that. Son, you kill. Oh, the question is, why did David not himself kill, but ask his son to kill? Because he's a scary bird. Too much history between us. Ah, we long time friends. Very hard for me to kill you. <laughs> anyway, why why you think he asked David? He asked his son. No. Anyone? Oh, the son, Ignatius. Why? He's <laughs> thinking. <laughs> why did Dad ask me to do that? <laughs> Ah, this is a wise son. <laughs> right? Now, you have to remember, David knows that Joab is a very capable general. He wins a lot of battle. And the man that is with David, you will see the next chapter, uh, the other chapter, super duper soldiers, you know. These are people like amazing Kung Fu masters, you know. <laughs> These people are fight with him. They are also with Joab all this while. Chu Sen Ru Si, I say, is it? What is that? Huh? Go out body and go through death together. All right? <laughs> Something like that. They, 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 they went through battles together. And like Ignatius say, King David know that if I give a command to get rid of Joab, he's not sure how he's going to be. You know? Because these people went to battle with him. You know? They might say, hey, you want to kill my general? They might turn against David, correct? The point is this, you know, sometimes in life decisions are very difficult. It is, sometimes there are some decisions you can't, you, you, you can't take. You have to be wise. Understand that? But did David avoid that decision? No. David still knows Joab must be dealt with. If not, Israel will be in trouble. Okay? Joab must be dealt with. To him, he knows his king, God appointed him, and he also knows that God appointed Solomon. So he says, Solomon, you must get rid of Joab. If not, Joab will be a threat to God's nation. He's not trying to protect his son, you know. David is, has always been, in a sense, when it comes to the um, uh, kingship, he said, no, you must get rid of him because the nation will be in trouble. Now, when he, and he gave me a lot of trouble as a king, but why he asked the son? Some decisions you cannot make immediately. Why, why ask the son? I thought about this for so long, so many semesters, you know. And in, no, no one gave the answer. Why? Ah, uh, okay, could be that, but it has to do with the nation. Anyone remember? David cannot do it because in David time, David's time, the nation was still very divided. Very often divide, like now again going to divide. All right? One group follow him, another group want to follow Sheba, okay, after we study Sheba. The nation has not settled, but David will eventually unite the nation before he dies, right? The nation will be united. When the nation was united, God also gave him the timing, time to go, time to hand the united nation of Israel, north and south, to his son Solomon. Okay, to his son Solomon. With a united nation. Hmm? With a prosperous nation. 
Do you think the army is so crucial anymore, in a sense? It won't be. David knew that while it's divided, he needed Joab. Understand that? He needed Joab. He tried to replace, cannot. He needed to wait till the nation is united when, when there are not much battles anymore. Soldiers going fat. Mm. When these things happen, okay, I'll give you an example. Singapore, prosperous, peaceful, united, right? We have an army. This one record. <laughs> we have an army. Do you think our army, our army can fight against even Thailand army? I'm not sure. Right? Thailand has a far bigger, more experienced army. Right? We decided to buy some aeroplanes here and there. Right? Does the government really focus on we must build military might, have nuclear power and all that? They don't. The nation is prosperous, is united. The focus is the economy. Understand? The generals and all that. Now, it's different when a country is turmoil. Huh? The generals usually very powerful, one, right? The generals anytime can rise up and topple the government. But in Singapore, it's peaceful and all that. The army is just there for some deterrent. That's all. The general won't be able to topple the government. When it's disunited, they can. The army is very dangerous. J David knew that. He's dependent on them. But once it's united, the army will be like enjoying their life, peace. They, when, when Solomon removed this general, replaced another one, there won't be so great a danger. Understand that? So David, I believe, will have to wait. My point is this. Sometimes decision in life, we have to be very wise. Sometimes we may need to wait for God's decision, God's timing to get something done. Sometimes we have to. All right? Maybe you're not facing this kind of situation yet, but remember that. Don't be foolhardy. You're right. Some things were foolish when he did that. Okay? So this is a very interesting part about David's life where he had to make one decision under walk the fine balance. I think this one, he knew. At this point, divided nation, very dangerous for me to do that. Now, need a lot of wisdom, right? Where are you going to get this wisdom? We better know God's word. You do not know God's word, you're going to make a lot of wrong decisions. Think about all these things that went wrong and went right. And do it right when the time comes in your own life, in your family, in church. Okay, so that was a problem for David. He faced that. Yes. <laughs> Did you die of old age? Eventually. <laughs> Eventually, no. Solomon went after him. <laughs> well, David didn't want him to take the risk. So when you become king, you better handle it quickly. Because Joab would still be quite powerful. Right? So he ran to the altar, hang on to the horns of the altar, say, don't kill me, don't kill me. Uh, but he, he um, would rebel. Okay, he would rebel. Now, um, what's that? Okay, now we say is Mephibosheth genuine. Huh? Now, there's another part when we make decisions that we must learn about. So let's see if Mephibosheth is true or Mephibosheth is, or his servant was true. Um, chapter 20, chapter 20, uh, chapter 19, verse 24. Okay, now, I read to you, Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came to meet the king and had neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. And then Mephibosheth came to the king and the king, in verse 25, asked, Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? I was nice to you. So King David was still thinking, your servants say you joined Absalom. How come you didn't go with me? Then Absalom, Mephibosheth in verse 26 say, and he answered, now you're King David, uh, now you have to listen and you have to make decisions. And he answered, oh my Lord, oh King, my servant deceived me. My servant deceived me 
and said, I will saddle me an ass that I may ride thereon and go to the king because thy servant is lame. He said, I cannot walk. My, my servant said, he put me on a horse and bring, you to, bring me to you, but he did not. Verse 27, and he has slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. But my lord the king is an angel of God. Do thou therefore what is good in thine eyes. Okay, he said, I was deceived. I was deceived. I wanted to go with you. My servant deceived me. Instead, he put me on a horse, sent me somewhere else. He went to you and said, I didn't want to follow you. Now, and then what happened? Verse 28. He said, for all my house, for all my father's house uh, were but dead men before my Lord. And he said, what right therefore have I yet to cry to you? He said, I, I'm not here to disturb you. Right, I'm not here to disturb you. And then, verse 29, king, the king said, now he made this decision, why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said, thou and Ziba divide the land. He said, why you come and talk to me about all these things? Right, David came back, if you're David, how? Hey, I just tried to kill, want to arrange all this, I, I'm, I'm at the gate, people might kill me still, and then Mephibosheth, you come to me, why didn't you go with me? My, my servant deceived me. Why you come to me now? Why are you disturbing me? I already told the servant, you all divide the land now. Don't stop, stop bothering me, right? Verse 29. Why do you bother me? J I just go and divide the land. What did Mephibosheth say in verse 30? Let's read 30 together. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king is come again in peace unto his own house. Now, David makes this decision. I already said divide. Don't disturb me anymore. Go away. Okay? Eugene, what do you think? Was Mephibosheth genuine or was the servant genuine? You think genuine? Why? Okay, he accepts what David said. But he may say, ah, oh, let him take all, but at the, at, in the end, don't divide. Right? So far, they seem to have divided. Nah. And now he say, don't think I'm coming here to talk about it. I, could, I, I don't care. As long as you're safe, oh my king, he can take all the land. But he may go back and say, nope, not sharing with you. So which one is true? Can you tell? Who do you think is true? Mephibosheth or the servant? Now you are the king, you know. Now you have to figure out what decision do I make? Not sure. Ben. Not sure. Caleb. You think Matthew Boucher? Because this poor guy can't walk. <laughs> it's a bit <pitiful. laughs> Right? He has a soft spot for, for the underdog. Now, I believe Matthew Boucher is true. Now, last time I read this, I still wonder, yeah, he still can say, oh, I'll take all, oh, I'll take all, but go back, actually. Say, no. I'm not sharing with you. I'm not giving you. We still share, right? Because the king still says share, right? It's fine for me to keep because king says share. Now look at verse 24. From verse 24, do you think it is true? He came, his feet was not dressed, means he never washed himself for very long. Since when? Uh, since until the day the since the day the king went out until the day king came out. So he's smelly already. Right? Then his late feet was lame, right? So needs carrying and all that because no feeling. So you say, look at him. Oh, the leg all black, dirty, smelly, the feet. Nor trim his beard, nor wash his clothes. Hmm? Remember last time they deceived the Gibbonites? They come with old clothes, moldy bread, broken bottles and say, we travel very far. But actually no, right? So what do you think? Could he have faked all this? <laughs> Correct. The beard bit a bit difficult. <laughs> you can go and find moldy bread, you know. You can find dirty clothes. <laughs> but for beard, <laughs> we have to go well, unless he put false beard. But <laughs> well, the Bible says his beard grew, uh, you know. How <laughs> to, to grow the beard falsely. So I think he is true. Right? He's true and the servant was actually false. Now, David, if he observed that now, even David was not sure. 
But David would have observed. David was always very observant. When the soldier came and all, he, could, he would notice what they say, what they do. But when for David to say, Oi, don't disturb me now. Lah. I would say, divide. Leave me alone. You know, I've got a lot of problems with the country now. <laughs> right? What do you think of such decision? Just go and divide it. Justin, young man, what do you think of David's decision here? Good or bad? Not sure. Bad decision, right? This is one of a low point in David's life. It was a bad decision. He made a wrong decision. With this, I think he would have known it's true. But he just said, don't disturb me. When we make wrong decisions, now what do we learn about making decisions? When we know we have made a wrong decision, and especially if we have the upper hand. Now, fathers, when you make a wrong decision, husband, you make a wrong decision and you know you can just override things. And when you realize it's wrong, it is doubly wrong to just ignore it and say whatever, I just do it this way. Right? David should have righted the wrong that he made. When we make wrong decisions, one of the things we learn is when we are, conf okay, 7C, right? When we are confronted with wrong decisions I have made, what do I do when I'm confronted with wrong decisions that I've made? No matter how pressing matters are. It's very easy as fathers. Very easy as a working man at work. I make a wrong decision, but I've got so many project problems. Someone come and say, hey, you know, and say, ah, whatever, I just go, go away and do it this way. But they suffer loss, right? So when, no matter how pressing, correct it especially when it is in your power. Correct it, number one. Number two, put yourself in the other person's shoe. Put yourself in the other person's When we make decisions, besides seeing it as God's, God's land, God's church, also put ourselves in the other person's shoes. Not to compromise, huh? but think. You see, just do it like that. So sometimes it's very difficult. Uh, we are pressed, but, but don't make that bad decision that David made. It was a thought, yeah? Now, in the past, King David, typically, when he finds out something, he gets angry. That underdogs have been taken advantage of. He's always like that, right, in the past? He should have just done what he's always done. Now he has pressing matters. So when we're making decisions under pressing condition, we still must be in character. David's character has always been this is wrong, he will get angry. Remember when, when Nathan brought the story. There's this man, and then he took this other poor man's lamb. What was David's character? What? Bring, kill the man, you know, that kind of thing. He deserved to die. His heart is like that. But now he has pressing matters. He's, he got just deposed. Son just died, mourning. Don't know whether people will follow me under those conditions. He forgot to act what he used to be, right? So wisdom in making decisions must maintain no matter how pressing situations is. As a father at home, sometimes you have a lot of problems and then your wife comes to you or your children comes to you and you've made a wrong decision earlier on. Don't just cover it and say, ah, whatever. In fact, a father recently shared with me. He said, you know, I made a wrong decision and then you know, my wife came to me and said, hey, but you see, it was wrong in this. And he, he tried to ah, just push it aside and say, I'm, and he was very busy and he was sick. And after that, he said, oh, he felt so terrible. When we are under pressure as men at work, men at home, we can become like that. It's so out of David's character. Right? That's not David. But this was a low spot. So be careful when you have to make decisions under a lot of personal pressure. Okay, still maintain that carefulness of doing what is right. right. David would have, David in his normal person would have say, tell Ziba this is the king's order. Yeah. Oh, whatever, you know, all right. Or make it right. But instead this, this uh, crippled person, so it's a, it's a low point. It's a low point. It's 8.30. Okay, so we'll continue the others.
uh, about his decisions. There are many other decisions that will continue after here, which were good, which were bad. What do we learn? But I want us to remember, always make decision, understanding this is God's family, God's children, God's church. I am God. It's a spiritual decision. Don't just look at all the physical relationship, number one. Number two, when it comes to making the right decision, biblical separation, even if it's even it's my own flesh, I must be ready to do what is right. Okay? That's another one. Then the last one is two wrongs don't make one right. Remember that. That's very tempting, but refrain at all costs. Refrain at all costs. And what else did we learn? Some decisions, you may need to pray and wait for God's timing. Very difficult. Okay? So, I hope some of this, we begin to learn life is not so simple, but decisions will always keep coming. David reached the gate, one decision after another needs to be made. When you reach home, the same, right? When you reach work, the same. Piling up. <coughs> Make right decisions. Let us pray. Now, someone asked, what is the difference between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Someone also asked, can we just have instrumental music? Can, can we worship God with instrumental music?